I thought you might be interested in knowing why we were happy to join in sponsoring this film. It's as simple as this. The future of our pharmaceutical industry, as well as my own company, depends solely on the medicinal tools we place in the hands of the medical profession. If the pharmaceuticals we make are improperly used, or if they do harm rather than good, we know that in the long run we will both suffer. We have an important stake in the practice of medicine and in the standing of the medical profession in the eyes of the public. For that reason, we are glad to cooperate in this educational effort to emphasize the dangers of drug addiction. And it is a particular hazard for those who have access to these potent drugs. But there is another important reason. For many years, we have observed the work of the United States Commissioner of Narcotics, the Honorable Harry J. Anslinger. We know of his success in curbing the spread of addiction throughout the world. No other man has had a greater influence in stemming the illicit traffic in narcotic drugs. He has gained ground despite the pressures of international intrigue, the ruthless menace of the underworld and the conspiracy of communism to undermine the morale of its enemies with narcotic drugs. He has withstood a maze of bewildering propaganda confusion and misunderstanding. The film you're about to see was prepared at his suggestion with the collaboration of Dr. John C. Krantz, Professor of Pharmacology at the University of Maryland. I hope you will like it. Every calling in life is confronted with certain hazards. Medicine is no exception. Not the least among the occupational hazards of medicine is that of drug addiction. In the time-honored profession of medicine, there prevails a surprisingly high incidence of addiction to narcotic drugs. This wound must be healed. What a loss of manpower essential to the defense of our nation. What a waste of years of training. But worst of all, society loses a doctor and acquires a patient who can seldom be cured. To combat this waste of physicians and salvage these priceless human values, the Narcotic Commissioner of the United States and the Professor of Pharmacology of the University of Maryland have conducted an educational experiment for nearly two decades at this medical school. The commissioner in person and the professor have in no uncertain terms brought the classes face to face with the addiction hazard among physicians. Through these years, 
the knowledge of the Bureau of Narcotics, not one of these students so instructed in their course in pharmacology after becoming a physician has fallen prey to drug addiction. This film is dedicated to the prevention of drug addiction among the members of the medical profession. It can be done. Dr. John C. Kranz, Jr. Ladies and gentlemen of the medical school, this morning, as your guest lecturer, it is my pleasure to present the Honorable Harry J. Anslinger, United States Commissioner of Narcotics. His topic is Addiction and You. Commissioner Anslinger. Dr. Krenz, young ladies and gentlemen, for many years I have stood here for the purpose of pointing out the dangers of drug addiction, especially among young physicians. I shall pull no punches. It is a serious problem, and I shall approach it with all of the force and urgency that the situation warrants. It is my purpose that not one within the sound of my voice will ever succumb to narcotic addiction. You know that the principal addiction drugs are the derivatives of opium. Opium is obtained by drying the juice of the unripe oriental poppy known as Papaver somniferum. This plant is indigenous to the densely populated lands of the Orient and Asia Minor. In many of these areas of the earth, population pressures are so great that famine and pestilence are rampant. Also, hard labor with primitive tools exacts its devastating toll in misery and illness. Here, opium often brings a surcease from the almost intolerable existence of the teeming ignorant millions. But such escape from reality has no place in Western civilization. The United States produces no opium. All of the opium used in this country is imported. When a shipment of this precious cargo arrives in port, the utmost governmental surveillance guards its transfer from the steel enclosures in the ship's hold through the United States Customs to a bonded warehouse. Constant vigilance by the United States Customs agents and the Bureau of Narcotics supervisors every step in the passing of this cargo it is destined for the relief of pain. Careful records of every ounce of this drug will follow it until you use it on your patient. From this crude opium, morphine is extracted. It is your hand that writes the prescription which legally moves the morphine sulfate tablets from the pharmacy to the bedside of your patient in pain. Many drugs, some derivatives of opium, and others which are synthetic chemical compounds evoke addictive hazards. The principal use of these addictive drugs, as you have been told, is in the relief of pain. For this purpose, they occupy a place of prominence in the armamentarium of the physician. But, like the finger of God, they can heal and they can smite. Therefore, it is important to assess the addictive hazard of the drugs in this class of analgesics. These data are most clearly presented by Vogel and his associates. One notes the low addictive hazard of codeine. But what is addiction? The consensus is that it rests upon the tripod of tolerance. More and more drug is required for equivalent effects. Habituation, a psychic dependence upon the effect evoked by the drug. Physical dependence, distortion of normal physiologic processes resulting from long use of the drug, necessitating the continued use for partial maintenance of physiologic equilibrium. It is a form of physical and mental bondage which results in no uncertain moral and physical destruction. Yes, this could happen to you. Let us see how it happened to a young doctor. I shall call him George Smith. Now, this is a real case from my files of physicians who have become addicted to narcotics. 
This will be revealed based entirely upon this record. George Smith sat in your place in a certain medical school some years ago. He was proud to wear his white coat and let the stethoscope dangle from his pocket. He too was thrilled when the first patient addressed him as doctor. Young Smith threaded his way enthusiastically through the maze of courses clinics, examinations of the third and fourth years of his medical curriculum. He was a good student. His sights were set high. He, like you, was sure that the day he was graduated a new era would descend upon medicine. His fiancée, a student nurse, shared his views. They had often discussed them together. Soon he would be a real doctor, write M.D. behind his name. They would be married and establish a home of their own. Their dreams, like yours, filled the skies with the infinite azure of hope. At long last, because it had seemed like an eternity from the gross anatomy laboratory to commencement, George Smith became George Smith, M.D. And Dr. Smith, on his oath, pledged to give no deadly drug to his patient, and certainly not to himself, for he was a disciple of Hippocrates, a doctor. And Dr. Smith swore his allegiance to the honorable profession of medicine and to himself. In purity and holiness, I will guard my life and my heart. For when Dr. Smith walked into the sick room, he was the representative of Pasteur, Koch, Osler, Harvey Cushing, and others who would look down upon him from the great Valhalla of medicine. During the second year of internship, his fiancée, now a graduate nurse, became the proud Mrs. Dr. George Smith. Five years passed. Dr. George Smith was a promising young physician of Calverton. He was ambitious. He was going to the top. Nothing could stop him. Mrs. Smith was encumbered by the care of their two young children. Smith was busy. He must make contacts. He must meet and know the right people. He was determined to make a social success as well as a professional and financial triumph. Yes, these were influential friends, and Dr. Smith must emulate them. For five additional years, Dr. Smith kept up this devastating pace. Rung after rung, up the ladder of success, the biggest practice in town was the usual comment when his name was mentioned. Really a wonderful guy. Doc never seems to tire. He is a living dynamo. Doc Smith never takes a vacation. You never see the Doc with his wife and children. He is too busy. He's going like a whirlwind all the time. Dr. Smith was a strong social drinker, but under the intense pressure of his active life, he began slowly but surely to resort to solo drinking. It afforded an escape from perplexing duties and often served to knit up the ravel's sleeve of care. I'll bet Doc Smith's liquor bills keep him stepping. Oh, Mrs. Smith's boy, that doctor fella is sure gone to pot. I can't trust Dr. Smith anymore. I lost my confidence in Dr. Smith. He's slipping badly. What will happen to their poor little children? And so the gossip traveled regarding Calverton's most successful doctor. Mrs. Smith persuaded her husband to take a vacation with the family. 
he had decided to let up for a while. Tickets were purchased, reservations made, trunks packed, and then the phone call. An appeal to address the annual meeting of the State Medical Society in place of Dr. Wells, the distinguished internist who had been taken ill. Would he accept was the urgent plea? Success was too great a magnet for Dr. Smith to resist. His wife and the children needed him, but he couldn't spare the time for them. His success was too precious. Always promises were made and always promises were broken. The children existed on a plane of constant disappointment. Dr. Smith's life had become a series of pyramiding pressures of appointments, conferences, and meetings with everyone who mattered socially and professionally but seldom with those who needed him desperately. His family. His wife and children left George writing another paper. It was entitled, Early Clinical Symptoms of Peptic Ulcer. But these outward signs of success were not a manifestation of a tranquil spirit or a well-integrated mind within the weary body of the busy doctor. He was tired, tired always, desperately tired, but too busy, far too busy to consider a vacation. Besides, he must pursue the ostentatious life which he considered commensurate with Calverton's most successful doctor. What is more, he could not sleep. He had become a chain smoker long ago. Transient ulcer symptoms, recurrent vertigo, perhaps some hypertension. Oh, not at 35, he thought. Besides, he was just too prominent and too busy to consider these facets of his own health. The relation to his family became strained. Mrs. Smith chided him about overwork, his pallor, his languid appearance. This was of no avail. The die was cast. When he banked his first $25,000 and served as president of the State Medical Society, he would then take things easy. Perhaps then the long-promised vacation with the wife and children. It had been a discouragingly hard day. Patience and more patience. Ailments and the sea of other people's troubles. This night, a swig of whiskey failed him as a hypnotic. 300 milligrams of a barbiturate left him wide awake. He was dizzy and cream and crackers failed to relieve the gnawing epigastric distress of the incipient ulcer. Emotional turmoil intervened. His troubled mind pictured Mrs. Rader as she looked so comfortable after that shot of morphine. I wonder how it would affect me. Besides, I must get some sleep, he rationalized. Just once wouldn't make any difference. Then, too, I am a doctor. I know about this matter of addiction. I know what to expect. Besides, my bag is right here. All oh, what driving forces are propinquity and availability.
and Dr. Smith had started on the road to no uncertain destruction. It was the serpent in Eden which would lead finally to his being cast out of the garden of his profession. What a blessing. Dizziness is gone, epigastric gnawing disappeared, and he repeated those immortal words of De Quincey in Confessions of an Opium Eater. Eloquent opium, which brings a brief oblivion to the wrongs unredressed and insults unavenged. He had committed them to memory as a student. How very real they were now. Dr. Smith could not resist further escape from reality from his chasing windmills, from his perplexing symptoms of fatigue. Tolerance was rapidly developing and habituation, that unrelenting, obtrusive guest had forced an entrance into his life. But with this drug, he was now able to superimpose a false tranquility over an exasperating anxiety and fatigue. The false euphoria soon passed but Smith, like other addicts, could never dispel from his mind the honeymoon of his addiction. The pleasant false euphoria of these days. Now he tried to break it. Withdrawal symptoms set in. Besides, he had to keep on working, and so he was back on the drug in a few days. The nod constantly offered him its insidious comfort. Six months later, Dr. Smith is a different man. There were many changes in his physical and mental being, and all of these were for the worse. He shuns the life in which, just a year ago, he was an idol. His practice is vanishing. He is in debt. Mrs. Smith is aware that something is happening to her husband but she dared not speak to him about it. They were almost strangers. Intuitively, she senses the oncoming doom. Mrs. Smith inadvertently saw her husband in the process of injecting himself with morphine. She knew the consequences. He resented her discovery of his addiction and responded violently. But something else has happened to Dr. Smith. It always does. He had let down his moral barriers. The constant vigil of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which supervises every stage of the sale and administration of narcotics, had recognized blatant irregularities in Dr. Smith's prescriptions for narcotics. Dr. Smith had repeatedly written prescriptions for morphine using fictitious patients' names. This legally constituted fraud. And when large quantities of narcotics began to move from one drug store, the agents investigated. That evening, a stranger called to see Dr. Smith. In the privacy of his office, he presented his badge. He was a federal narcotic agent. Dr. George Smith, I am narcotic agent Joseph Brown. You have violated the Harrison narcotic law. You are under arrest. I want you to accompany me to the office of the district supervisor at the Calverton Post Office building. For two months, the evidence had accumulated. It was now unequivocal. Smith was an addict and had violated the Federal Narcotic Act. Sentenced to one year in the Federal Prison Hospital at Lexington, Smith starts the long, tortuous road back to uncertain recovery. Within these walls, Smith is subjected to all of the modern therapeutic measures designed to break the addiction to morphine. The drug is gradually withdrawn. Withdrawal symptoms are reduced to a minimal. Rehabilitation is instituted psychologically and physiologically. New habits of work and recreation are some of the measures to which Smith must become adapted. Under this carefully supervised program of physical and mental reconstruction, 
Smith achieves a temporary victory over the bondage of addiction. One year later, George Smith is released on probation. Society has lost its investment in this doctor and has acquired the liability of a patient whose cure is still doubtful. His precious license revoked. His spirit is broken. His family and home are gone. Smith goes to another community far away. Calverton and success are past. Here, Smith finds employment as a service station attendant. The oath of Hippocrates, the golden age of medicine, the meteoric career of success, all fade in the dim mist of an ever-lengthening past. He tries to wipe out all unpleasant memories of the past, but addiction is an unrelenting enemy. In these new occupations, there was no emotional challenge. Despair, anxiety, fretfulness, and disenchantment soon overtook him, and he craved again the escape from the reality which morphine afforded. Soon he was back on the drug secured through illicit channels. Physical and moral degeneration returned. His only associates were seasoned criminals. Smith stopped at nothing to get morphine. In attempting to steal a doctor's bag, he was caught, and the inexorable arm of the law committed him to the penitentiary for five years. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not fiction. This is the actual course of events. This is the usual way in which doctors become addicted. Stress, strain, overwork, drink, unbridled ambition, an attitude of being able to win in a battle in which there is no victory. These, together with some personality defect, from which no one is immune, or any one of them singly, may lead the doctor to addiction to no uncertain destruction. There is only one cure for addiction. Don't let it happen to you.